Today I'm talking about one of the most important doctrines in the New Testament and what I believe is the next major prophetic event that's going to be happening in the world, which is the rapture of the church. I'm also talking about something huge in the news, which is a Supreme Court case that could overturn Roe versus Wade coming up very soon, something we all need to know about. I'm answering questions such as if a Christian is living an immoral lifestyle when Jesus returns, will they go on the rapture? And what happens to backsliding Christians? Will they go up in the rapture? Those questions and more I'll be answering. I'm Jimmy Evans. Welcome to the Tipping Point Show. Tipping Point. I'm so glad that you've joined me today. You know, I'm talking about the rapture of the church today, which is a very important doctrine in the New Testament. Someone once called the rapture of the church the most preposterous teaching in the Bible or the most preposterous belief that Christians have. And you know something? It's either really weird and preposterous or it's true. And I believe it's true because the New Testament talks about it so graphically. Now, there are people that teach that the rapture of the church is a relatively new doctrine that the church began to teach like in the 18th or 19th centuries or something like that. I absolutely do not believe that because it's so clearly in the Bible. Some people teach that there is not a pre-tribulation rapture, a rapture before the last seven years, the horrible last seven years on earth, but there is a rapture at the end of the tribulation. So I'm going to be talking about all of that answering a lot of questions this program today and the next programs coming up, talking about the issues related to the rapture of the church and the return of Jesus and things like that. But let's just begin by answering the question, what is the rapture of the church? And we're going to let the Bible tell us what the rapture of the church is. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul, he does us a great favor and he gives us a very graphic description of the rapture of the church. And this is 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, beginning of verse 13. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede, means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. And so, now this is comforting. And the Apostle Paul, he's saying, I don't want you to be troubled about people who have died in Jesus. He calls them people who are asleep. And that's just because their bodies are like this here on the earth. But their spirit is in the presence of Jesus. He says, I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who are asleep in Jesus so that you don't have hope, so that you're confused or upset about those people. He says, I want you to know that when the Lord returns, He's going to bring those people with him and the dead in Christ will rise first, just like Jesus was resurrected. They're going to be resurrected out of their graves and their bodies will be transformed into glorious bodies. Now, we have people ask questions about what if my relatives were cremated or what if my relatives were lost at sea or something like that. God knows how to find every person. And all he needs is one strand of DNA and that person will come out of the grave wherever they are, glorified body, and their spirit that is in the presence of Jesus will be reunited with that body. That happens first. The second thing that happens is we who are alive and remain will be caught up to meet the Lord in the clouds in the air. And this is very important now. The rapture is a private event that happens in the air between Jesus and the church. The second coming, I'm going to be talking about that on our next program. The second coming is a very public event and every eye will see him. And it happens at the Mount of Olives in Israel, in Jerusalem. And so very different events here. But the Apostle Paul is telling us to comfort us that the Lord is returning. And when he returns, the dead will come out of their graves. But we who are alive and remain will be caught up. It's the Greek word harpazo. It is the Latin word rapturo. That's where we get our word rapture. And so it is a biblical word. It's in the Latin Bible. But this is where we get our word rapture. And the word rapture means to seize hastily. It means to snatch away. And so 1 Corinthians 15 gives us 
a very clear uh, explanation again of the rapture. And here's what it says. 1 Corinthians 15. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. And so we're, it's going to happen in the twinkling of an eye. It says in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, the word moment there is the Greek word atomos, where we get our word Adam. It means an indivisible amount of time. When Jesus returns and the rapture happens, it's going to happen in too short of a period of time to repent, too short of a period of time to make wrong things right, to apologize, too short of a period of time to become a Christian. And so people who are playing games with God right now, when the rapture happens, it happens instantly, instantaneously, the twinkling of an eye. And Jesus comes and we are taken from this world to meet Jesus in the clouds, in the air, and we go to the marriage supper of the Lamb with Him, and then we spend eternity with Jesus. Now, Jesus is going to describe the most important words in the Bible, according to the laws of biblical, interpre biblical interpretation, are the words of Jesus. The words of Jesus define everything else in the Bible. So Luke 17, if the teaching of the rapture is a new teaching in the church, or if the teaching of the rapture, you know, is really not a biblical teaching, well, Jesus sure graphically describes the rapture in Luke chapter 17. In fact, he doesn't just describe the rapture. He describes what's going to be happening in the world when he comes back. This is Luke 17. As the lightning that flashes out of one part of under heaven shines to the other part under heaven, so also shall the, so also the Son of Man will be in his day. Now that's talking about the rapture. It's talking about lightning in the heavens. That's what he's going to do. He's going to come in the sky. But first he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. And as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be also in the days of the Son of Man. They ate, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. And the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even so will it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. In that day, he who is on the housetop and his goods are in the house, let him not come down to take them away. And likewise, the one who is in the field, let him not turn back. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever seeks to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life will preserve it. Now here's where Jesus is going to graphically describe the rapture of the church. I tell you, in that night, there will be two people in one bed, the one taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding together. The one will be taken, the other left. Two men will be in the field. The one will be taken, the other left. And they answered and said to him, where, Lord? So he said to them, wherever the body is, there the eagles will be gathered together. So again, this is a description of the rapture. And Jesus said, as the lightning flashes in heaven from one part of heaven to the other, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be in his day. He's coming. The rapture of the church happens in the sky. And then he says, as it was in the days of Noah, as it was in the days of Lot. The days of Noah, the world was absolutely corrupt and violent. And God regretted that he had made man on the earth. Men were so bad. Okay, And so in those days, there was a righteous remnant of people, Lot and his family, eight people, and they were uh, preaching the gospel to the people around them. They didn't have any converts because they were ridiculed, you're, you're, I'm sure. They were ridiculed. You know, Noah looked like a jerk, an idiot, until the day the rain started, then he looked like a genius. And for many of you who are standing for Jesus in these times, you may be made fun of by your family and friends or people you go to school with or people you work with. But I'm telling you, in the twinkling of an eye, you're going to look like a genius because Jesus is coming back in the midst of a world full of rebellion and immorality and violence. But there is a righteous remnant, and I hope that you're a part of that righteous remnant, waiting for Jesus Christ to return. And Jesus says, as it was in the day that Noah stepped on the ark, pre-judgment. Noah didn't get on the ark during the flood or after the flood. He got on the ark before the flood ever happened and God sealed uh, Noah and his family in the ark. Then the rain came. He said, it will be like that day. And then he says, as it was in the day 
that Lot went out of Sodom. Now, Sodom and Gomorrah was a place of horrible immorality and rebellion against God. And so the angels that came to get Lot out of Sodom and his family, okay, and to take them out, the angels said to Lot, we cannot judge this place until you're gone and you've arrived safely at your destination. Okay, Jesus said there'll be buying, selling, marrying, giving in marriage, planting and building. It will be like on the day that Lot went out of Sodom and Gomorrah. See, God didn't tell Lot to build a bunker because he was going to have to go through the fire and brimstone judgment. God told Lot to get out and the angel said, judgment can't hit this place till you're gone. This is why I believe that the rapture of the church happens before the tribulation begins because the tribulation is called the wrath of the Lamb. And God's not mad at us. This is Matthew 24. And by the way, when people say that there is a rapture at the end of the tribulation, they're right. There is a rapture at the end of the tribulation. This is Matthew 24. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. Now see, this is, this is, everyone's looking at Jesus. This is the second coming. This isn't the rapture before. This is the rapture at the end. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. And they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. That is the second coming. That is a public event where every eye will see him. But at that time, he sends his angels to the four corners of the earth and they gather his elect. Those are people who got saved during the tribulation. So there is a rapture before the tribulation happens for the church. For those of us today who have put our faith in Jesus, we're not going through the tribulation. Now, when the rapture happens, Christians are gone from the earth, except for 144,000 Jews and two witnesses in Jerusalem. And so the earth will be rid of all the Christians on the earth. However, we know that many people are going to get saved during the tribulation because the uh, Revelation 6 and Revelation 20 talks about the martyrs, people who are being martyred for their faith during the tribulation by the Antichrist, the most evil man in the history of the world. So if you're a Christian right now, I'm telling you, you will not be here for the last seven years, the worst seven years in the history of the world. But if you are here when that happens, if you don't get raptured and you're here, there will still be grace to be saved, but it will be a severe grace because it will be the worst time in human history and the Antichrist will be ruling the earth and, and uh, martyring millions, if not tens or hundreds of millions of Christians during that time. Here's another question that I want to answer, and that is, so that's what the rapture of the church is. Is Jesus coming to take his bride to be with him forever? And so, but why is there a rapture of the church? This is another good question. Well, there's two reasons. First of all, is to unite us with Jesus, to be married with him forever. In our last program, I talked about the marriage supper of the Lamb. I talked about, you know, John 14, where Jesus is telling his disciples he's going away to prepare a place. Uh, in his father's house and coming back. That's all wedding language. But the second reason that Jesus is returning is to remove us from the wrath of the tribulation. This is Revelation 6. The kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of His wrath has come, and who is able to stand? The wrath of the Lamb. Isn't that a crazy phrase? There, have you ever have you ever been afraid of a lamb? You know, if you're afraid of a lamb, I mean, you're you're a pretty afraid person. And so, a lamb. This is the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. They've spit in His face. They've rejected Him. They've taken His name in vain. They've rebelled against Him. And we have had an age of grace where Jesus has offered his grace in spite of that. There's coming a time of judgment where Jesus won't take it anymore. And there's going to be wrath poured out on the world. Now listen to me. Jesus is not mad at his church. Jesus is in love with his church. Why would Jesus leave his church, his bride, here on the earth for seven years to go literally through hell on earth? When we're, he's not mad at us. The wrath of the Lamb is poured out on the people who have been in rebellion toward God and will not repent. And so Jesus is coming to remove us from that wrath. Listen to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. 
For they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had with you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. Jesus, we're waiting for Jesus to come from heaven to return and he delivers us from. Listen, it doesn't say he delivers us through the wrath to come. It could very easily say that. If we're going to be here during the tribulation, I mean, it would just say he's going to deliver us through the, the, the wrath that is to come. He delivers us from it. This is 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pangs upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night or of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night. Those who get drunk are drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. Listen, for God did not appoint us to wrath but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ who died for us that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another just as you are also doing. Did you know that when the Bible says that Jesus comes as a thief in the night, that's talking to unbelievers, not believers. Paul says, you're not of the darkness. You're of the day. That day shouldn't overtake you as a thief. You understand Bible prophecy. You understand the signs of the times. And you also know that God has not appointed us to wrath. Comfort one another with these words. Let me just tell you something. I've read the Bible, read the book of Revelation many times. And if you want to comfort me by telling me I'm going through the tribulation, I'm just telling you, you're just fresh out of luck. I've read it. And you can't comfort me by telling me that, but I can tell you how you can comfort me. You can tell me, comfort me by telling me I'm not going to go through the tribulation. If I know that I'm not going to go through that, that is greatly comforting because I'm going to escape the wrath that is to come. Luke 21, one more scripture. But take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, and cares of this life. And that day come upon you unexpectedly, for it will come as a snare on all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. So Jesus is saying here, now be careful the way you're living your life, you know, because the end is coming. And when the rapture comes, remember when Noah got on the boat, the door closed, the whole world was trapped in judgment by the flood. When Lot went out of Sodom, the all of a sudden, the whole community was trapped in the judgment of, of, of hellfire and brimstone. And so as soon as the rapture happens, we escape, but the world is trapped. Listen to what Jesus said. It will happen like a snare on all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. You can't get a more inclusive statement than that. The entire world, every one of the world is going to be trapped under judgment, when the rapture happens and takes us out, they're trapped in judgment here. And here's what Jesus says. Watch therefore and pray that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things and to stand before the Son of Man. Listen, so people say to me, they say, Jimmy, you're an escapist. Exactly. You know, but I'm an obedient escapist. Jesus said, pray that you may be worthy to escape. Why would you? He didn't say endure. He didn't say, well, listen, you know, you're going to go through some tough times. The Antichrist is going to be one evil dude. But pray that you may be worthy to endure all these things. See, if Christians, some people say, well, we're going to go through the tribulation and God's just going to give us supernatural protection through that. I'll talk about that in one of the upcoming programs. I'll show you that that's simply not a true statement. But understand this. Jesus said, pray that you may be worthy to escape. Would Jesus tell us to pray something that couldn't happen? If we couldn't escape the tribulation, wouldn't that be a cruel thing to say? He said, you pray that you may be counted worthy to escape and to stand before the Son of Man. That's the rapture. For those of us who are believers, those are wise enough to choose Jesus now. And yes, you are wise if you choose Jesus now. If you stand for Jesus, I'm telling you, one day very soon, Jesus Christ is going to come in the twinkling of an eye and he's going to take you. And he's going to take me to be with him forever 
that where he is, we may be Thank you.